Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have nearly 900 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started today, as always, by giving one of the attendees an opportunity to win a Tech Nation Tour t-shirt for answering this week's trivia question. Today's sponsor, Rigel Medical, is headquartered in Florida. Which college mascot is named after Gatorade? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to join us at the MD Expo this fall, which will bring HTM professionals from across the nation to Orlando, Florida for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in technology. Registration is open and you can receive complimentary admission by using the VIP pass, compliments of Ragel Medical, found in the Webinar Wednesday workbook. If you did not receive this workbook via email today, you can download a copy on the dashboard under the handout section. You can find additional details on the MD Expo by visiting mdexposhow.com. All right, and the winner of the Tech Nation Tour t-shirt this week is Spencer McLean. Congratulations, Spencer. The correct answer was the University of Florida's mascot, uh, the Gator. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Rigel Medical. Rigel Medical is a leading manufacturer of biomedical test equipment, including electrical safety analyzers, vital sign simulators, infusion pump analyzers, electrosurgical analyzers, and Medi-based asset management software. Learn more about this company by visiting rigelmedical.com. Our presenters today are Jack Barrett, National Business Development Manager, and Rebecca Atkins, Biomedical Sales Engineer at Rigel Medical. Jack, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thanks, Jamie, and a big thank you to the entire Tech Nation team for providing this venue for us to reach out to the biomedical community. And uh, while I'm currently a resident of Florida, I did know the answer to that question, so I want to assure too. I'm going to kick off the presentation, and again, this is Jack. Um, once we get down to standards and classifications, Rebecca is going to uh, take over the presentation, and she's driving the presentation right now. And then we will both be available to answer any questions at the, uh, the end of the session. So, Becky, if you can go to the next slide, please. So, today's presentation, Electrical safety testing certainly is a, a pretty hot topic, has been for a while, and probably will be for a while as well. What we're going to do today is talk a lot about different test protocols, the 6601, 62353, and FPA 99. Talk about classifications, class one, class two, double insulated, ground pins, blah, blah, blah. blah associated terminology, but um, please, if there's one takeaway from this session, uh, we're not uh, sharing with you what you need to do in your facilities. Every facility has their own process in place, and uh, please don't go back and say, Jack or Becky said that we should be doing it this way. That's not our intent. Um, our intent is simply to, uh, to cover all of the, uh, the various test protocols, dive into the terminology a little bit, and uh, help maybe uh, provide some insight to you. Next slide, Becky. So just to kick off here, here's a little bit of a graph on the life cycle of a medical product. And it all starts with uh, some marketing input into R&D and then into production. And this is where the test protocol 6601 would be most prevalent, whether it's the AMI version, the IEC version. 6601 is the underlying test protocol for development of this device. And this is also where a 510K would be filed with uh, the FDA for US use. Once it leaves that production facility, it ends up on the doorstep to your hospital, your facility. And from that point on, 
through the life cycle of the entire product, that product is now your responsibility. And quite frankly, why you pay, play such an integral role to the entire process. Now, that dividing line also um, over time has changed a little bit where I spoke of 6601 being the test protocol during the manufacturing, engineering, proving of the unit. Once it gets out into the field, things have changed a little bit where we don't typically do high pot testing on a device once it's in the field. We don't do the same high current ground continuity testing as they do in the manufacturing engineering environment. Because certainly testing has shown over time that the more you stress a product, stress the insulation of the product, the greater opportunity there is for that insulation to fail over time. So test protocols such as the 62353 and FP899 are a little kinder and gentler, if you will, to the product after its past qualification and is in the field juice. Becky? So why do we do all of this thing called safety testing? Certainly it is the most common test that you do as a biomed, takes up a huge majority of your time. And the question is always, well, why are we doing that? The real objective is just to ensure that piece of equipment is electrically safe to be used in the patient environment. There is no shock hazard associated to it. And of course, when you're doing a PM, you're also doing performance testing on the product itself as well. But you always either start off or end with the electrical safety test and just to be sure that it's intrinsically safe for use in the patient environment. Becky? This whole thing started back in the early 1970s, where we'll get to this in the following slide. A gentleman wrote an article that was uh, gained a whole lot of attention. But it all has to deal with Michael shock hazards. And what that is, is just a, a minute amount of current passing through the human body, passing through the heart muscle, can cause some chaos to the system and that chaos is basically basically ventricular fibrillation where the heart muscle itself goes into a spasm when it's in that condition it is not pumping it's not beating and as it's not beating it is not pumping blood providing oxygen through the rest of the patient's body and all due to amount of a current passing through the heart muscle itself becky So I, I just referenced this slide a moment ago. This gentleman by the name of Ralph Nader, and Ralph uh, hails from the same state that, that I do, which is Connecticut, and is a, uh, a leading consumer advocate and still active, quite frankly. He wrote an article that was published in the Ladies' Home Journal. I have no idea why it was published in the Ladies' Home Journal, but that is where he found a, uh, a home for the initial article. And it addressed a number of issues. Now, there, there is a story that floats around that Ralph became aware of this when he was visiting a relative in a hospital itself. So not sure that is true or not, but uh, certainly makes for a, a better story. And as he started digging into the background here, he discovered, and a conservative number was 1,200 people a year were basically electrocuted while in a hospital, supposedly a safe environment. Also during that point of time, and I find this part a little hard to believe, but he speaks of only three hospitals in the country having biomedical engineers, clinical engineers on staff at the hospitals at that point of time. And the rest of the article goes into uh, great detail as to the issues uh, gives case studies of people who were unfortunately harmed, died during their stay in the hospital due to electrical current passing through them, uh, not just limited to patients, but also to physicians as well. And uh, you can find this article on the website. It's still out there available and uh, certainly is an interesting read. 
Ralph Nader is also uh, well known for another item, and that is the demise of a uh, fairly popular automobile at that point of time, which was the Chevrolet Corvair. He wrote a, an article called Unsafe at Any Speed, and uh, shortly after that, the Corvair went away. So preventive maintenance, the PM. Again, we spoke of why we do this, and it's to identify potential risks or identify problems. And typically, it always starts off with a visual inspection, and quite often the visual inspection will uh, show you what the issues with a product are, such as that previous photo that showed the uh, medical tape around the uh, line cord fixing a, a short. Um, but what we really do is we look at means of protection from a number of different aspect, aspects, the line cord itself, ground continuity, the insulation, leakage currents, also now called touch currents in many cases, and then again, the performance testing of the product itself. And then at the end, uh, this is an area that is constantly changing as well. Once you're done with that test, the documentation associated with the test, are you saving all of that data? How are you saving it? Are you saving portions of the data? Are you saving the electrical safety results? or just the performance aspects of the product itself. So always a changing and developing line of discussion regarding that. Becky? So electrical current, no surprise. Electrical current requires a closed circuit to flow. Um, the issue is when it starts to flow through the body, through the heart muscle, and can then again put the the heart muscle into a spasm where it's not pumping blood and oxygen through the body efficiently. There's always the risk, um, could be relatively small. I know a number of facilities have stopped testing patient leads because they've never found issues with them. Um, they have the background data to show their testing over time and the issues found or no issues found. But it's always a bit of a concern, so we always have to be aware that this issue does exist. And we talk about functional current and non-functional current. Leakage current is always defined as non-functional, where in the case of a defibrillator, where if the heart is in a spasm, we hit send the high energy pulse, six amps or so, into the heart muscle itself to bring it back into normal sinus rhythm. Okay. I always find this slide surprising because it shows just the small amount of current that can start to impact the, the heart muscle. And that really is around 100 microamps. And we'll talk um, later on if the presentation about single fault conditions or so, we'll find that 100 microamps in normal operating condition is one of the default levels that we, we watch for. Becky? For those who have attended one of our sessions on ESU testing, this is a fairly familiar slide because it, it shows the frequency spectrum for a number of different devices. But at line frequency, 60 hertz here, 50, K, 50 hertz over in um, European communities, it's a very dangerous frequency because our muscles can respond to that frequency. So our heart, heart muscle can respond to that frequency and our muscles can contract if we come in, line, in contact with that line. Our muscles can contract and we can't let go of it. So leakage current, as defined by 6601, is current that is not functional. And again, a current that is flowing as a result of capacitance, capacitance or resistance, or even inductance, dielectrics in the circuit itself. Goes from a fairly high potential to a low potential, from a plus voltage to ground, if you will. And again, if it flows through the heart muscle, it can be, uh, it can be an issue. Non-hazardous is controlled through the IEC 6601 or the AME equivalent of that. And that goes back to that very early slide that we showed of the design cycle for a medical device. So again, in the manufacturing, the design process, 6601 is the ruling test protocol. 
that is used to be sure that the product is safe when it leaves the facility. And as we saw in the earlier slide, if that current starts to exceed the safe uh, limits, it can start to be hazardous to the patient itself. Becky? Okay, this is where I'm gonna take over. Um, as, as you heard, I'm a biomed myself. Um, as my, some of my colleagues have told me, I've gone to the dark side, I've gone to sales, but look on the bright side, I can bring you shiny new test equipment and cookies when I come to your facility now. I never could do that in field service. Um, what we're gonna go over today is a couple of the different standards. Um, some things you'll see out there in the field. And of course, depending on your generation that you are biomed, and uh, not, not the age any of us, or where you got your training from, if it was from a private college or if it was military, or if you're just electronics tech transferring into the field, we're all gonna have some different terminology. So this is just to enlighten you and let you know the latest current and standards out there. So maybe we can all start talking with one language. Uh, some of the standards we're gonna go over are 6601, which Jack mentioned, 62353, and NFAP 99. Uh, some of the different ones you'll see if you get to travel around the world, um, and especially if you get your dream job in Australia, you're going to have to memorize a whole new set. But what we commonly use in America is an SAP 99, and we'll go over that in a little more in depth for you. Uh, first, we're just going to go over some class one um, things for 60601, because like I said, uh, 60601, we probably won't see it in the U.S. because most of us use an SAP 99. But if you have a piece of equipment that was purchased or made in the UK, you might see this in the service manual. And it'll have a couple different standards. And I've gotten some tech support questions where it throws some people off. So what we're gonna go through right now is talk to some stuff about 60601. So when you see it, you just won't be totally lost. Um, first of all, we'll talk about class one equipment. There's different classifications in 60601. Class one is basically um, anything you can plug into the wall. Class two, that's a little bit different. Um, this is going to be considered your double insulated equipment. Um, typically, this has a plastic case and battery operated. But that, it, we've all seen stuff outside the norm. So we've all seen stuff with double insulated indications that does have um, a grounding pin on it. So. This is just the classification area. It's double insulated equipment. When you're looking through the service manuals, you might see some of these symbols. So we're gonna get you familiar with them. Uh, the first one is just the regular ground symbol. And then if you notice the class two, it's the box in the box. And later on, you'll see this again. And so just keep in, in your back of your mind, the, the box in the box is for double insulated. Here's some other little symbols that you'll see throughout uh, when you're going through 60601. Um, some of you are probably wondering what ILMI stands for. In 60601, it stands for Medical Electrical Equipment. And so you can see that you'll have the B type, the BF type, and the CF type. And you'll see, and it kind of makes sense, you know, B for the body, and you have the little guy there. Right here is some classic examples of what you'll see for CF and BF. Um, you'll see these a little bit later on when we talk about the limits. This is where this will come into play. So when we're thinking limits, and we're talking about later on, just remember like um, for CF, the ECG leads. So this will help you out just a little bit later on, just keep it in the back of your mind. 60601, you can see um, it, it's um, a standard of testing. And it actually dates back about the same time frame that Jack was talking about when Ralph Nader started discovering that yes, electrical shark from equipment does injure patients. So more terminology we're gonna go through, Jack touched upon this, is um, single fault conditions. Um, you'll see this when you'll see it in the limits. Um, we're actually using the same terminology that we do in America, where they're talking single fault conditions like open earth, we consider that open ground. So if you're in a pub and you're having a beer with your UK friend and they're talking single fault and you're talking single uh, open ground, it's all the same thing. You guys can cheers. But I know you're not in the pub because you're too busy reading your service manuals So because that's what all us good biomeds do. Applied parts. 
Um, this is another um, term that may be familiar to some, but not familiar to all. Applied parts is anything that basically comes in contact with the patient. Here in America, the most common one we think of are ECG leads. Um, we're just going to touch briefly on 62353. Um, you, more than likely, um, you might not see it in America. Uh, some service organizations are having their field service reps test to the standard. But usually, uh, the ones that I've seen the most, well, of course, in FAP 99 and then in Service Manual 60601. But basically, it's along the same guidelines as 60601. It just gives you more standardization. And there's some manuals where you can get, uh, delve a little bit deeper into that. And of course, in FAP 99, that's what we use here in America. And like I said, depending on your generation or where you went to school, we have some different terminologies. So I'm just going to delve in um, and give you the different terminologies and actually give you the standards of why we're testing. Again, like Jack said, this is no recommendation of why you or how you should do at your shop. You should go by your SOP, what your shop says, or if you're field service, go by, you know, what your field service standards are. The first one, um, this is a little bit different. Um, I guess I'm a little bit older generation by ed, and the classification areas were different in my mind. Today, according to NFAP 99, and you can look here at 1.3.4.1, the classification areas are strictly for risk assessment. So we'll go here and we'll go in category one. And like I said, um, a lot of people, you know, that have different mindsets of what category one is. For NFAP 99 purposes right now, category one is just the designation. And in category one, major death could happen if the machine malfunctions. So in ICU, you know, that's where the patient is the most vulnerable. I mean, if, a, if, a, if something fails and the patient is totally healthy, yes, it might not injure them. But, you know, the ICU patient that's hooked up to every possible machine possible, they're the most vulnerable, and that's the ones we have to protect. That's our jobs as caregivers, is that's the ones we protect as biomeds and caregivers. So that is our job. I mean, nurses and doctors, they get all the credit for saving their lives, but we protect the patients also. And if you don't want to protect the patients, you know, there's no reason getting up in the morning putting on your khaki. Category two, this is where minor injury could happen. So we're thinking procedure rooms, like minor procedures, not, nothing like very invasive. Um, <clears throat> a dialysis room. We're not thinking the dialysis machine there because that can cause major injury. We're called, thinking of like the, the little accessories throughout the room. Category three, it's not likely to have anything happen. So what we're thinking here is like exam rooms. We're thinking like an otoscope. Um, I, I've never heard of a death by otoscope, but if you have, please email me. Uh, it's probably a really funny story, and I'd probably like to hear it. As you know, sometimes those biomets have twisted uh, senses of humor. A category four, it's not likely to have any physical impact. Um, what we're thinking, it says labs. We're not thinking back in the back where all the machines are. We're thinking like the blood draw room, um, you know, where there's nothing that could really injure a patient. Uh, and actually the morgues, uh, that one's a little bit questionable because if you've ever been in the morgue with your fellow biomeds and they scare you to death, you know, there might be some injury there. What we're going to do now is talk about classifications. Uh, we're, uh, in my background, my training, classification two, class two equipment, was non-patient areas. Right now for NFAP 99, class two is defined as double insulated equipment, just like what we saw on 60601. So again, depending on your training and your generation, you might have a, th a different mind set for class two. We're just telling you what it is now and what the standard is now. So you, you, we could all have the common language. Another term we're going to come across is fixed equipment or hardwired equipment. Um, this needs to be tested before installation. I've seen some people actually wire an H plug onto the hardwired equipment and test it before, you know, installing the hardwire. 
And this this reading should not exceed 10 MA. Portable equipment. This is equipment, you know, you think around, it's moving around the hospital, beds, ECG cards. But this can also be a bedside monitor. Because uh, even though it's fixed to the, the, the wall, it's still portable because you can yank that thing off and take it places, especially if the nurse breaks it and they can't move the patient. We've all been there. So you consider uh, pretty much everything as portable equipment unless it's hardwired. Now I'm going to go through some like different testing and just give you some different information about that. As Jack touched upon, ground resistance. Uh, this is the path for the current to take if it's leakage current. And we want this to be low because we all know that it's easier to voltage to pass through a 10 ohm resistor than a 100 ohm resistor. We just know that from our biomedical training. So it makes sense to us. Right here is just a little bit of the setup of how we're going to test for it. What you're going to do is you're going to plug the power cord of the unit into the safety outlet. And then your Kelvin cable, you can see right there where it runs over. And on the picture, it's not the best, clearest, but there's a grounding pin there. So what you want to do is put it on the grounding pin or a piece of metal that's not painted. That way you can ensure that you have a good ground. And that's the, one of the, the biggest things in testing for the ground resistance is making sure that you have a good viable ground. If you're actually looking at NSAP 99, if you grab the manual and pull it down, I know we all like to read books without pictures, but this book has no pictures, and this, will, this is what it will actually look like when you're seeing and reading the actual paragraph. And if you notice on this one for ground resistance, about halfway through, it says to flex the cord. And some of the younger biomeds are probably wondering why. Well, we all know nurses' favorite way to unplug equipment is to pull the cord and not buy the, you know, plug. So this causes breaks inside the cord. If you flex it and your readings start fluctuating, this is a good indication that you might have a bad cord and you need to replace it. Because, again, with higher resistance, it's not going to go out the ground, cord, ground pin like it should. Right here is the limits that we should be looking for. And you see where it's 0.5. And then here, right here is where we start to see with 60601, the limit's 0.3. And I've had some, some uh, people actually ask me, I, I know it's obvious to a lot of people, but some people have actually asked me what happens if the testing and there's no broke, if, there, if the grounding pin's broken off. Well, that's an open circuit. And, um, it's pretty much the same result if you take your voltmeter and hold the leads up in the air and try and get some, get a reading. It's still an open circuit. You're not going to get a reading. You need that ground pin, unless, it's, unless of course, it's double insulated. Okay, uh, the next terminology, again, depending on your generation and your tech school, uh, is leakage current. It's now called touch current with NSAP 99. Because uh, this is more in line with the international standards, IEC. Um, it's been called leakage current, chassis current. You hear all these different currents. But now when you actually read an NSAP 99, it'll be called touch current. And touch current for portable equipment, um, what it is is basically, um, as Jack said, that current will flow to the easiest path. So what you're doing is the current's going from point A to P, B. And if you're, something goes wrong with the machine and your point B actually becomes the patient, which it should never be, but it, God forbid it does, you want that leaky churn to be low enough that it doesn't hurt the patient. Okay, we've all been told that there's different standards of how to test and on the old testers, we've seen a million different knobs and a million different, you know, reversible polarities um, and all these other things. Uh, right now, on an FAP 99, there's four ways to test. It's ground closed, power on and off, and ground open, power on and off. And this is where you'll start to see where it's written out in an FAP 99. And if you want to go to these, like um, 10.3.5, 
you can actually look and see the actual regulations that are, that are according to these. If you look here, about halfway down the page is uh, 10.3.6. And this is where it'll start getting into lead leakage on portable equipment. And this is what it's talking about for ECG leakage. And this is what we were, uh, Jack started touching about. But this is the actual regulation for you. And here's a simple overview of the limits that you should be looking for, um, 100 and 500. But notice down on 60601, you see the only equipment, and then you see normal condition and single fault condition. And like we said, single fault condition means open ground. So this is all the same common language that you'll have with, with your UK predecessors over that beer in the pub. The leakage, um, this has changed a little bit for some biomeds, and for other biomeds, this is the way they were taught. All of these are pulled together and, and, and tested from the point of ground. Um, during some, some of the older testers, you've seen it have the knob that will go between the leads. And I've heard biomeds, and I used to do it too, that they said that was the troubleshooting method. But for when it's all pulled to pull the ground, what I do or I recommend is you put one lead on at a time. And then if your 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 reading fluctuates, you know you have a bad lead. But but still don't stop there because we all know that you know there's always more than one bad lead. <laughs> it never just stops at one. Our life can't be that easy, right? <laughs> and here's another of what we're going to be looking for for when you do the lead leakage currents. And you can notice right here, down to 60601, you can see where the BF and all the different types come in. And if you notice, like I said earlier, uh, you don't see any of where it says to test, you know, with the, the reverse polarity or anything like that. And right here is the quick overview table of between the leads, like I was talking about. And then you can notice 60601 still tests between the leads. Um, NFAP 99, you know, they arbitrarily just, just came up one morning and said, hey, we're not going to do that anymore. It was the result of a lot of testing. So that's why NFAP 99 doesn't have that anymore. It's just not an arbitrary just decision. So, I mean, some people are asking, oh, 60601 still does it, and NFAP 99 used to do it, and it was an arbitrary decision through many tests and through many decisions. That's why we're not doing it anymore. And if you look here, the patient isolation test, it's not required by NFAP 99 either, but 60601 still does that. And uh, on the same guideline, the NFAP 99 through the testing. And right here, um, the next we're going to talk about class two. As you, if you can see, that's what I was talking about. It's still designated by in class, in, uh, NFAP 99, it's still designated by the square and the square. The only thing is NFAP 99 no longer instructs for testing of uh, double insulated equipment. I know a lot of places do it, does, does double insulated equipment a lot of ways. Um, I know most just do a visual inspection on it and check, check for visual since, you know, they can't really test. Um, there are some other methods that I've heard. Um, it's really up to your facility how they react to double insulated equipment. So just please follow your your standards. This one, this change is great. Uh, for any of us who's ever been in call at 3 o'clock in the morning and the patient wants to use his laptop and the nurse is freaking out because it doesn't have a safety sticker, if your facility lets you do this, if your SOP, this is the best. It states that non, uh, uh, well, a qualified nurse and best judgment can determine if the laptop's safe and put a safety sticker on it. But if your facility deems that you need to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, just enjoy the overtime money. Have a beer. The next what we're going to do is, like Jack talked about, is the visual inspection. Uh, of course, you want to make sure that the housing is debris-free. Um, if it has blood and guts, uh, hopefully you're, you have a great re relationship with your central steroid department, and they can clean it for you. If not, uh, I know all of us have gloved up and cleaned it ourselves. So uh, just to let you know. Um, 
And then the other thing, if you look on down, is the fuse rating. You want to make sure that the fuse has the appropriate rating. Um, uh, that's not, uh, uh, unless it's been in for repair, it should. But, you, you know, you never want to overfuse anything because that's a potential fire hazard. And for all you military biomeds out there, there's this really good, uh, funny meme that I've seen where somebody replaces the fuse with a, a, a bullet. You'll have to look it up. It, it's pretty funny. But going back to the basics, what I was talking about with uh, the ground resistance, it all starts with the power core. So we're just going to go over some basics. I know there's some all different levels listening in, so we're, bear with us. We're going to go over the basics. Um, what you're going to do is, like for discolored pins, you want to make sure it can indicate an arcing inside the plug, or it could in a, indicate that you have a bad wall outlet. That's where you're going to get have to get you know your plant services people involved. So you're just going to look and, and the strain cord also. A lot of those can be frayed um, and broken. And the strain release is actually there, you know, for a purpose, to prevent the strain. And if you do have to replace it or replace an H plug, um, we're just going to go back over some wirings. Uh, we know we, uh, we have the U.S. code. It's white, black, green. The international is brown, blue, and green. Um, we all have the things for how, you know, we uh, remember things. We all know they're the one for uh, uh, re resistors. But I was taught this one for um, power cords. Uh, younger biomeds probably won't understand it. Um, it's from the Beverly Hillbillies. You'll have to YouTube it. Uh, the opening line, there's a song that has uh, black gold, Texas tea. So I rem always remember from that song after I sang it for two minutes and, you know, that's how I repair my power cord, is that the black wire goes to the, to the gold tab. And, you know, and 20 minutes later, I can go on to my next PM after watching an episode or so. The next, we're going to go for uh, one of the test processes, the, one of the biggest changes that I've seen out there. And this actually happened um, in FNAP 2012, 10.5.2.1.2. And you can actually go and look this up. And it's where it changes the standard required from 12 to, and six months. And, and to, it doesn't have to be that. But what I'm saying is uh, this is not me telling you to run to your manager and tell him, hey, you don't have to do your PMs. You have to go buy your shop special, what your shop recommends. But this is just a change in what the recommendations are for the frequency of how often it should be safety. And here we're going to touch upon what uh, Jack was talking about with the data. Um, you can do it electronically. I've, I've had some people, you know, they just scan it and they go. Uh, some people still use paper and pencil. Um, the basic thing is what you do is uh, do what you say and say what you do. And if you do those two things, you know, you're pretty much, you're good to go. So just follow your, your um, guidelines for your shop. And the other thing is the traceability. Um, a lot of people don't think about that. But it's always helpful to be able to look at a past work order. And if you do have, you know, the, the, the actual readings for the safety, if you can see that they, they've gone up, hey, maybe it's time to slap a new power cord on there. Oh, uh, for closing, this is the NFAP 99 that I was talking about. It's uh, 2015. Actually, um, I've heard that there's a newer one coming out. It's not out yet, so we are still going by 2015. And that's what the reference was were, that I made today. This is a little handbook that we put out in conjunction with Amy. I highly recommend this. It's a very easy read. It does common language that's very easy to understand. Uh, I know we. I said we are not going too far into 62353. Um, this book is, it's, uh, we put it out. We'll send you a hard copy or a PDF of it. It's just a basic guide and it goes all the way into the history and all the way into the physics and everything you ever wanted to know about the safety. So if you want a copy, just feel free to contact us and we give you tons of hard copies or a PDF of it. Um, here's another book for recommended reading. For uh, all you see that's out there, you know you need the points. So grab the grab it, get the points for uh, your your CBET renewal. 
Uh, now we're going to open it up some questions and answers. Um, here's our direct contact, or if you want to come by our booth at Amy, come by and say hi, and uh, let us know uh, how are you doing out there. And I'll turn it back over now so we can open it up for questions. Perfect. Rebecca, this is Jamie. Um, we do have quite a few questions that came in, but there are two things I want to get to first before we get started. Uh, first is just reminding all attendees, please, you can still submit questions for this Q&A at any time using the questions feature on your dashboard. We have several in queue right now, so we'll try to get through as many as we can before 3 Eastern. Any that we're not able to get through, we're going to send over to Jack and Rebecca for them to follow up with you offline. A second thing I want to get to, a few of the attendees mentioned that the links you were providing in the recommended reading section, uh, that they were not clickable, but they are interested in that information. What would be a good course of action for them to get this information? Could they potentially email you with the information on the screen? Uh, yes, we, we can email, drop us an email and we will send you back the link so you can just click on it through your email. Great. So all the attendees that had asked uh, to be able to click, email Rebecca. She will happily send you out the reading information so you can get that. All right. So now let's get to some of the questions. Um, first one, uh, and Jack and Rebecca, I'm just going to ask a question. Please feel free to chime in if uh, you think you're best fit to answer this one. Can your products identify situations when there is more than one ground path? Oh, Jack, I know you love this one. I do love this one. So, <laughs> <Your> yeah. <favorite. laughs> we we do have that capability. Um and it's 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 a rather important capability. Think of a system, um maybe a stress machine where you have a treadmill on um, the monitor connected and there's there's all kinds of interconnects going between the various pieces of equipment. Our testers when you're doing the um, the resistance, ground continuity resistance. If it senses that there is another path to ground, it'll come up with a warning message advising you of that. And then you can start trying to, and typically it's a deconnector somewhere that's providing an alternative ground path. If you don't do that, you're going to measure zero resistance, which zero is, is always kind of suspect, um, because we're bypassing the um, the body resistance that's built into the safety analyzer by that alternative ground path. So, you know, as we've said a couple of times, if you have a, a 1K resistance or a zero ohm resistance, current's going to flow through the zero ohm resistance, bypassing 1K resistance built into the analyzers, and you'll get an erroneous reading. Perfect. Next question. I need universal voltage input. What can you offer? We have two. Um, they run uh, 95 volts up to uh, 260 volts, and they're both manual testers. Uh, we have the Safe Test 50 and the uh, just recently introduced Safe Test 99, which uh, can do universal voltage input. So no need to have a couple of different analyzers to do your uh, your different uh, line voltages. All right, here's an attendee question that uh, this attendee would like to know. Given that we rarely, if ever, see touch current values exceed NAFPA limits, are touch current measurements still a value? Yes. Because like I, I said, um, depending on your shop and your SOP, um, even if it, it's not injured the first six months that you do it, there's nothing guaranteeing that it didn't break that second six months. And our, our job is to protect the patient. So if it broke somewhere in between your two safeties, um, you, you want to make sure that, you know, you're protecting the patient. So, uh, yes, it's not required by NSAP 99 on a regular basis, but if your shop requires it for patient safety purposes, yes, a touch, touch current is, is uh, the best. Just to add to that a little bit, um, a lot of facilities are now looking at AEM programs, alternative equipment maintenance programs, and that allows you to start to put a critical eye to test data over a given course of time, and course of time is going to vary from facility to facility, but it does allow you to take that historical data 
do an analysis based on that data, and then determine what you're going to move forward with as your standard process for the facility as to what you're going to test and, and what you're going to um, not test. Why are we still doing electrical safety inspections given there is no documented microshock injury or death? I guess, um, good question. Um, maybe I'll just answer it this way. If you were the one that was in that bed or at that facility or hooked up to the equipment, would you be comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> I concur. <laughs> As do I. That was like a your great mom's answer, on Jack. <laughs> what was that, Jamie? I'm sorry. That, that was a really good answer. It's a great perspective. <laughs> Even if it's never happened, I don't want to be the first. So please keep testing. <laughs> I can tell you a story about uh, I was having some nasal polyps removed, and there was an old FX in the uh, in the surgical unit that I was going to. But that's a different story. Going off on a tangent. Please continue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Are there new standards that in-house biomed departments should be aware of? Well, I guess sorry, the um, oh. <laughs> so new standards to be aware of. Um, I guess the the only new standards as such is is pretty much what what Becky went over. I guess sixty two three fifty three could be considered a new standard. Um, and that's just a subset of the 6601. And 62353 is, is designed for products that have already been qualified through the 601 but are now located in the field. Um, NSPA 992015 would be the, the latest um, 99 standard that we have here in the States. 2018 is in the process. You always could go to the NFPA website to uh, see what's all going on with that. They, they look for input. But um, that would really be it as far as, as new processes or test protocols that, that, that I'm aware of. Great. This next question is going to stay with that theme. Uh, speaking to safety regulations and any other regulations that we should abide by, are these all standardized throughout the country or do we have to adhere to each state's standards? <laughs> um, NFPA 99 is dictated by law in several states. Uh, actually, a, a fair number of states. I think the last count was like 26 or, or something states. However, with the, uh, the, the rate and pace of state legislation, quite often it could be an older standard that they refer to, like 2007. Um, so it, it really does come down to if your facility is using NFPA 99. Uh, if you're audited, they always look at standard process for the facility and, and kind of judge you on that. So I think it kind of boils down to NFPA 99 and whatever the standard process is for the facility. Becca, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, no, it can vary from facility to facility, even in the same city, depending on the standards and practices of uh, if it's a third party company or if it's in house. So. Basically, I defer to, uh, you know, your shop SOP. Uh, but like you said, some states do reg regulate it, but um, we, we're not for sure what copy that they might be using. Perfect. Well, let's see. Um, I got a few more that I think we can get through before 3 o'clock. Uh, next question, what is the best practice for developing an electrical safety inspection protocol when there are no guidelines given from the OEM? Uh, basically, you, uh, if you're doing NSAP 99, you want to t uh, test for the ground resistance and the touch current within the limits that are specified in, in the NSAP 99. What parameters are calibrated periodically in an electrical safety analyzer for ISO 6061, which are the acceptable limits? <laughs> so that was, that was a preview question that came in early from one of uh, the folks participating, and, and I had no idea. So I had to go to our, uh, our lead calibration tech and, and gain some information from him. 
So there's, uh, there's actually a number of, of different parameters. And uh, you start off with uh, resistance measurements and precision resistors to be sure that the resistance measurement capability of the analyzer is wind specification. And then you look at all of the, uh, the leakage current, the earth leakage current, uh, enclosure leakage current, AKA touch current, um, patient leakage, the patient leads, um, and those are both a, an AC and DC measurement in 6601, same as uh, patient auxiliary leakage, that's an AC and DC measurement, and then you have the F-type leakage, um, which is uh, mains on applied parts as well. So they're all, um, they're all tested within 6601. They're tested within plus or minus 5% of the reading, and uh, there you have it. And thanks to our, uh, our lead calibration tech for providing that information. All right. I have one here regarding the Joint Commission. Has the Joint Commission adopted the NFPA 2015 standards, to your knowledge? Uh, yes, they have. I, I have heard of some, uh, um, you know, the the pre joint commission things that you that you can hire to come through your hospital. I have had uh, some people that have ta have uh, done the pre ones. They, they ask for six oh six oh one, but then they show that the, their practice is NFAP ninety nine in their shop, and so they adjust from there. But uh, the actual uh, com joint commissions, they're, they're always looking for NFAP ninety nine, from my understanding. This question. And I think the. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I think that the the other part of that is a lot of the audit. It's kind of like a um, an ISO nine thousand audit. They um, they do a lot of the auditing auditing to whatever your standard um, processes are. So that's the other piece that that comes in standard processes for the facility, and that's another piece of, of what they kind of do their uh, their judgments on. Okay, this question's from the same attendee, and it, it may require more of an in-depth explanation, so if we need to follow up offline, certainly let me know, but could you go over the pertinent changes from the NAFA 2012 to NAFA 2015? Uh, that's yeah. something best covered offline, unless you want to. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the changes were actually pretty minor and had to do, um, one of the biggest changes is the old circuit diagrams used to show a, an open neutral as well, while the verbiage um, only talked about the open ground being a single fault condition. So eliminating the um, open neutral is one that comes to mind. I think there um, also the categories that Becky was describing was a big change along with the capability of patient owned equipment, non medical equipment used in the uh, patient environment being able to be approved by uh, other personnel. That's a summary that comes to mind quickly. There, there might be a couple other things that uh, we can follow up again, again later. Yes, and I will send over contact information for that attendee and the question. Um, as well as the additional questions that we have in queue. Again, attendees, if we did not get to your question, we're going to send it over to the Rigel Medical Team, and they're going to follow up with you offline. But right now, I want to give a big thank you to Jack and Rebecca for taking some time to share their knowledge today. And of course, thank you to Rigel Medical. Again, to find out more about this company, their products and services, visit their website, rigelmedical.com. Remember that one lucky attendee does have the chance to win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. You must complete the survey to obtain the certificate of attendance. If you do not see the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Uh, webinar Wednesday is going to take a break for two weeks, but we're going to be back again with two to three presentations in August. Please check our website for upcoming webinars that you can register. It is onetechnation.com forward slash webinars. Have a great rest of your Wednesday, and we will see you back in August.